Thank you so much, Jenna. It is, uh, it's so great to be here. And uh, we, Mark and I have been planning this for a long time. And so it's just fantastic to finally uh, be with you and to get to introduce Mark Elston uh, to a lot of my subscribers, to a lot of you who are doing the In Housing the Holy Advent Christmas series. So Mark, welcome. It's so great to have you with us. <laughs> Great to be here. Really glad for the opportunity to talk and uh, get to be connecting with everyone. Great. Well, we have people continuing to come on. And so you, as you can see in the chat, we're from all over the United States and Canada. Uh, and so really excited to have this conversation today. Now, Mark and I met through my research this summer. I did some research on a Lilly Grant looking at entrepreneurial churches. These were churches who were uh, actually had a death date, right? An expiration date. And they turned it around with some really innovative ways to connect with their neighborhood, uh, to be a vital place, to do church a little bit differently. And so a uh, part of my literature review was to find out who was, you know, helping churches do this. And Mark was one of those at the top of the list. And then uh, happily, his book uh, dropped just about the time I was doing my research. So uh, it was really an important part of my research, but even more than that then became an inspiration for creating the In Housing the Holy Advent Christmas series for this year, uh, because I was just so inspired by the work that Mark and churches uh, all over the country are doing to bring a vitality and financial stability to their community so that they can do uh, more work in the world uh, to make the world a better place. So Mark, uh, at the beginning of every webinar that I do, I, uh, I play something to help center us, to remind us why we do this, why we're talking about this. So I'm going to um, just share the trailer actually from uh, our Advent Christmas series that I worked on this year. Many of the folks on this, um, on this webinar are doing that series. And I'm just gonna play this as we center our hearts uh, for this conversation to remind us that uh, the work of housing the holy, making more room in the inn is what we are all about. So let's take a look. So, you know, in Mark's book, he says that uh, we have the opportunity to open the barn doors uh, rather than build bigger barns, uh, utilizing the parable of the rich young fool. Uh, and he says we have an opportunity to put our capital to work in the world. Mark believes and I am uh, convinced that we have a wealth of creativity, perseverance and resources that exist in church institutions that can be put to work for mission in new ways. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Let me just quickly introduce Mark. He lives and works at the intersection of money and meaning as an entrepreneur, a pastor, a consultant, a speaker, uh, and he is the co-founder of Rooted Good, which seeks to create more good in the world through social innovation. Uh, he's the executive director of Prez House on the University of Wisconsin's Madison campus and the owner of Elston Strategic Consulting. But before you call him, I think maybe he's not taking any more clients right now, but we'll check with him on that. Um, <laughs> and uh, importantly, Mark is president of the board of directors of Working Capital for Community Needs, an impact investing fund that provides microfinance for the working poor in Latin America. 
So Mark has degrees in psychology, theology, and business. And I think that's a winning combination. Um, and I can see all of that at work in your work and in your book. So welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Good to be here. So let's talk about Barnes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Since it becomes a uh, a, a big uh, subject in my Advent Christmas series, that idea that you know, no matter how uh, what condition our places are in, <laughs> our inns are in, there is the possibility of housing the holy. Um, that we can, in fact, take what we have. That we have perhaps more uh, resources than we can imagine. That we that we do imagine, and. Um, so I just want to kind of not bury the lead. Uh, I want to uh, ask you right away, what do we need to know? What do churches need to know right now, right out of the gate? Uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of ways to do church, but maybe not all the churches are uh, sort of a, looking in a broader scope about what they could do. Yeah, I, I think we're in an interesting time right now the church broadly speaking um, in that we're sort of dealing with three converging issues uh, one is of course sort of financial resiliency and questions about how church is funding itself and the just the reality of so many um, not always and not all of course but many um, facing uh, you know shrinking numbers shrinking memberships shrinking budgets and that sort of thing and I think that's you know broadly speaking happening, um, around the country uh, pretty pretty regularly. Um, so there's that factor. There's also, at the same time, I think a lot of questions about what does it even mean to be the church today? And, and the pandemic has just massively sort of accelerated that question, right? What is it? Yeah. yeah. What does it mean when we can't use, our buildings were largely designed for sort of one thing, an hour on Sunday morning. And then it's so, the sort of associated programming. That's basically what most church buildings were designed for. And then during the pandemic, when that's not what's happening in the buildings, or at least for part of the, you know, part of the, that period, depending on what part of the country you're in, um, what does that mean then? What does it mean to be the church, right? So there's that question. And then I think the third that is really important is that we're sort of dealing with not uh, a really difficult, what I call wicked problems, not wicked like evil, but wicked like complicated, complex problems in our neighborhoods, in our communities, um, racial equity issues, uh, climate change, um, disparities in wealth, education, healthcare. You know, there's just really, really deep, difficult, challenging issues. And I think many of us in the church want to be involved in those issues, but we're not entirely sure how. These three things actually all in some ways converge um, around what does it mean for the church to do the church? What does it mean to be the church present in our communities, addressing these wicked problems and also dealing with financial realities that are dramatically changing? Uh, and so what, I'm, what I've been exploring in, in my work and in my book is this idea that we actually have a great deal of resource available to us. Um, it just sometimes looks different than we might initially expect. We have a lot of, a lot of valuable property in many church settings, um, extremely valuable property that's vastly underutilized. Um, and we often in many church, broadly speaking, again, sort of denominational networks or whatnot have a lot of money, uh, invested money. So we might not have the same level of giving that, that we've seen in, over the years or over the decades in terms of you know, membership giving and whatnot, but we actually have probably more wealth in the American church than is ever, the church has ever had in, in the history of, of Christianity. There's just there's trillions of dollars of, of invested assets um, uh, that are sitting there uh, in the stock market largely um, that church institutions own. And, and so the question I, I've been sort of wrestling with and asking and wanting to challenge us to think about a little bit is how does that all come together? How do we put the properties we have, the assets that we have, the, the investments that we have to work for different expressions of what it means to be the church? Um, 
I mean, it's a very Christmas theme. How do we incarnate that in our neighborhoods, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so you're really talking not just to individual churches, but certainly to individual churches. And I'm hoping that um, folks have taken me up on my suggestion, especially if you're doing the in uh, Advent series, to have your leadership teams reading this book either before or during, uh, because it's a wonderful complement to the spiritual question. You know, there's the financial questions, the spirit, the theological questions that you bring together. So it's individual churches, but it's also the church at large. What are we doing with this invested capital? Uh, and how is, how is that um, really incarnating the values uh, that we believe uh, that, that they should be put to work to make the world a better place? Um, so let's stick with theology for a second. Um, you know, in, in my research, uh, one of the things that came out in these uh, conversations with, with churches who had kind of turned themselves around, uh, the question of ecclesiology, who are we as the church, was one of those initially difficult conversations um, because we have this idea about what the church is, what the church does, what the church building does. And, um, and actually, that's not, uh, historically, that's not that old. As you said, we're, the, the structures we're in were, were built in the last, you know, decades. Maybe some have 100-plus-year-old buildings, but they were built for a specific purpose. And, and so talking about ecclesiology and purpose and getting our minds around the fact that the church can actually uh, exist or look or incarnate in different ways. What's your What's your experience with uh, working with churches around this this question of who is the church? What is the church? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Maybe I'll just tell a little bit of story if that's okay sure. about my yeah. own contact at Press House. So I'm um, I, I obviously doing this work kind of across the country and, and talking about it and so on. But I'm also a practitioner. I'm a pastor as well, um, mm -hmm. Presbyterian ordained and uh, and I've been doing this work very locally uh, at a campus ministry center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison for the last 17 years actually. And one of the things that I, I always like to, to tell people, I, I'm a pastor, I love preaching, I love worship. Um, that's all really important. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's part of, I mean, it's a, it's a central part of what it means to be the church, right? To come together and worship God in community. Um, but the thing that's most exciting to me um, in some ways about the ministry we do at Press House is, is actually our residential um, programming. So we have an apartment community that houses about 240 students that live with us um, year-round 24-7. Um, well, it was certainly 24-7 during the pandemic when they had nothing to do besides, besides live in there in their apartment. Um, and we were engaging with them in a completely different way, um, you know, really impacting their lives in a very different way and reaching and connecting with a very different type of student that wouldn't necessarily come to a Bible study or, right. you know, come into a worship setting. Um, and so I would argue that's the church, though, like the church is being the church. You know, one of my favorite stories from that is uh, we have a, a community of students in recovery, um, addiction recovery. So it's a sober living um, apartment. And uh, these are mostly students actually dealing with heroin addiction and fairly significant challenges. Many of them would not graduate from, from the university um, or perhaps even sort of survive, you, you, you might argue, were it not for this program that we offer. And to me, that's the church being the church. I mean, we are situated right in the heart of a campus that deals with major issues around addiction, alcoholism, and alcohol use, drug and drug use, and so on. And we're sort of getting after that problem really in a very core, uh, very direct, very relevant way. And, and so um, while worship life is central to what we do, so is this program. Right. Um, so being the church is sort of being present in the midst of that and then putting to use our property yeah. to build housing, which can house students that need sober living and change their lives like really dramatically. Um, so that's just sort yeah. of an example. Yeah, of, exactly. Of so the church is happening. I mean, it's all church. It's all church. Um, and, and that apartment uh, complex was not there when you went there. 
Uh, so this is some, this is a way that you transform, you helped transform you and a lot of other partners uh, transformed the property. Say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm going to actually just put one link in the chat here. I think this okay. will work. Um, hopefully, yeah, uh, this Great. is to uh, presshouseapartments.com, the website. And the reason is just simply there's a very there's a very short video on the homepage of that of our apartment Great. page that gives you a visual of it, which is kind of yeah. nice for to see the visual of it. So yeah, so in in 2004, my wife, who is who is pastor, uh, along with me, and actually now the lead pastor um, at our ministry, uh, she and I came to Press House together and kind of were tasked with rebuilding what was essentially a dormant ministry and then exploring this idea of building housing on, on the parking lot that was um, behind the, the, the historic church building, right in the center of the university campus. And so we put up, you know, I mean, this is like a, obviously really shrinking the story, but in the end, we, we, we borrowed quite a lot of money and, uh, and, uh, and we put up a seven story um, building, which, which can be seen on that website link. And, um, and we housed, you know, 240 students, about half of them are involved in purposeful living communities and receive scholarships in their, uh, as part of their living that with us. Um, last year, 95% of them were engaged in some sort of activity that we were doing. This is not Christian housing. The students are all kinds of faiths, all kinds of backgrounds. That's intentional. We um, we want to be just really connecting with who's present on the campus. Um, and it's uh, it's been remarkable both programmatically and financially. It's also changed entirely the, the financial picture of our organization. Um, our budget grew 1,500% um, over the period of three years where 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 we could have launched this and uh, and um, it generates more than two million dollars a year in revenue for our organization and yeah. has really changed everything about about what we do. Yeah, and really, you know, what's what seems to be central in this discernment process about, process about how to be church where we are is the where we are part, right? So it's discerning Absolutely. the context, the community you know, and not just from our own, like, this is what we think the neighborhood needs, but in actual conversation uh, with, with a lot of people uh, in the neighborhood. Um, you said, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, property assets. And one of the things that your book does so well, and chapter eight, you know, all of it talks about this, um, it, it is to talk about the greatest working capital that most of us have is our properties. Um, and that, you know, there's, um, there are, is a lot of underutilized property. So if I can just turn to this for a moment, um, this idea of property, because this became central for my research as well, um, because all of the success stories that I researched utilize their property in vastly different ways, right? Context is everything. They didn't all do the same thing. Um, obviously, you know, you're in the middle of a, a of a university. So that was, that factored heavily into what you did. Um, but, you know, you mentioned in your book that Methodist leaders in North Carolina have estimated that church property is in actual use about 12% of the week. I think a, a lot of us can relate to that. Um, and the future of many of the properties is up in the, up in the air um, that, you know, the rate of closure is, uh, is happening quite quickly and because of the pandemic, maybe even exacerbated, sped up. Um, so let me just share a, a couple of things. And we're gonna, I wanna show a little video of a church that util, utilized their property in a little different way than you all did, just to get another example out here. And then we can talk more about use of, of property. Um, so here we go, let me get, all right. So in my research, you know, of course, uh, we realize that this, this fact that you put in your book as well, that, um, you know, property is becoming a burden, some to denominations like the Methodist denomination that actually holds the property. Um, so, you know, what to do with this property becomes a denominational problem, uh, but also it becomes a municipality and city government problem sometimes. And so, you know, we were looking at literature, at articles and things, and so cities and municipalities are getting in on the conversation because of abandoned church property. Um, and then it even is on the national stage as well, the Washington Post, um, you know, writing about this. 
So this is a, quite, uh, qu quite the conversation at this moment. So I think what really um, struck me or what I really wanted to in, in sort of um, evangelizing this, <laughs> you know, I think you're part of the good news, Mark, and, and others who are helping to work on this is to let churches know that there's actually quite a lot of different possibilities between just doing it the way we've always done it and closing. Like there's a whole wide range of things in there. So let's take a look at a, a short video from a White Rock United Methodist Church and their, their story. I got appointed to White Rock United Methodist Church as a part-time local pastor in July of 2012. And so when I walked into that environment, it was quiet. Outside of the hours of nine to noon on a Sunday morning, there was very little activity in the building. Room after room that was empty and it was cavernous. Like it was just empty. Well, it was a church that uh, had, you know, probably been on de in decline for 30 plus years, partly because the neighborhood got older, uh, therefore the congregation got older, and uh, a great many people began to pass away. And so the income that was lost by that versus newcomers' income didn't compare. The church had been living off of an endowment, a foundation for, for several years, and I was blown away by the amount of uh, money we were spending to keep the church's doors open, the staff paid, and the lights on. We had an old building that needed a lot of work and a lot of deferred maintenance in the facility. We had no relationship to our neighborhood, and we had really no direction. The congregation was worn out. Oh, they were tired. For the past you know, three years, they've been really kind of embattled in this fight to stay open. The general attitude was, uh, we're gonna stay right here. We're not gonna change. We're gonna see it to the bitter end. Well, if we've told the community that we were going to close, we did a really good job of that. But what we didn't do was tell the community that we didn't close. Mitchell had said, you know, I'd like to talk to you about some of the ideas that we share about church revitalization. We agreed to meet over here so that he could show me the space. I, I totally uh, saw it at that moment, what it could be. The thing we tackled um, first was the narrative that our church building was a liability. White Rock's physical space is a great asset. It's actually the thing that can help us uh, survive. And that meant finding community partners to come into our building and lease space from us. You look around and try to try to create a couple things to start off that will attract people into the space. What kind of change can we make in the community if we decide that we're not going to just sit inside our building, but we're going to build new places for communities to happen? The first one that we came up with was a community garden. The idea that it would go on a parking lot, that it would be very, very visible was a pointed attempt to show the neighborhood that yes, the church is still here, there are things going on. Um, and at that early stage, it was uh, an invitation for people to envision what other spaces would, would become. I began to wonder like, what could we put in this building that would make our, our space come alive? There was a real sense of that giving each of those spaces a new vision, a new purpose would be relatively easy. We partnered with organizations that were gonna do things better than we ever could. So we knew we couldn't run a kid's theater like Andrew Hunter can run a kid's theater. We knew we couldn't run a preschool like the Children's Center runs a preschool. We knew we couldn't create a co-working space because we've never done co-working, so we had to find a partner that would help us create that. We had an article written in the Dallas Morning News saying that the church was open essentially for use. We started taking every community meeting we possibly could. We got with the Mission Wisdom Foundation with the co-working space and co-created that. We spent a lot of time pouring over leases. We spent a lot of time uh, finding the right community partner. We spent a lot of time um, in the neighborhood getting to know folks. Once we began to have some renters, then it sort of multiplied itself. People began to say, oh, well, heck, I'd like to have space in that building as well. Studio Bella, uh, Arts for Kids. Music Together. Music Together, Rays of Light. The Children's Center. A Hottie Sewing Collective, Mix Co-working, Epiphany Dance Studio, Neighborhood Teams. Neighborhood Associations. Little, Little Forest Hills Neighborhood Association, Casa Linda Neighborhood Association, 
Sanger Elementary benefits from our classroom cooperative. Lots of individual artists, lots of individual designers, workers. It's a busy place. Congregational buy-in was easy, right? And it was easy because they realized that we had to do something drastic to stay open. They were so close to death that they were really willing to try just about anything. We really just wanted to make the community feel like they had a space again. We wanted to return to being a parish in the neighborhood. So Mark, what, what are your thoughts uh, seeing that? Um, so many things that I think are simpatico with what you've written as well. Yeah, it's a great example. I mean, it's a great example of uh, turning the idea of a, of a liability into a, realizing that it's an asset um, and then making use of it and really just really opening that up and making use of it. I think that's fantastic. I mean, what a great, what a great story. What a great example of trying to connect with what was going on in the neighborhood. I think another thing that's really interesting about that that's so true is partnering. Mm. Partnering is, is very often really important in this work. I mean, there, you know, there's, there's rarely a church that has all of what it, you know, all of the sort of skills, capabilities um, needed to do this stuff directly. Um, uh, I mean, maybe that can be some, you know, some of that developed and maybe there's a specific things and gifts churches have, but often it requires bringing in expertise right. Um, right. to do that work. Um, the one thing I would actually just... <laughs> I love it. I love the idea, but I will say that one of the things I've seen that churches often move to right away is renting space yeah. and renting space. It can be both really powerful, but it can also be a little bit, um, it doesn't always work super well the way people hope. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And one is that it often doesn't generate the revenue folks really think it will, um, especially if you net out actual costs Right. So it's really important, and this is, you know, to think about what is it costing the church to rent space out, not just what are you bringing in, because there's, there's often, you know, custodial costs, there's you know, heating and electric, there's uh, just the wear and tear, there's staff time, all of that's real, and that all adds up. And if you net that out after what getting paid in rent, is it actually generating revenue? Not always. Sometimes, actually, I found when I came to Press House, we were renting a lot of space out to, to community groups. Um, and in some cases, we were losing significant money on it. So we were raising money in order to fund them, um, which might be fine if that's part of the mission. But if it is, the real problem is one that's not then mission aligned. So the renting is happening costing money and it's not particularly mission aligned in some way, then it's, mm -hmm. then it's questionable as to really whether that's, uh, you know, the best use of, of the space. Um, so anyways, it's just, there's yeah, a no, lot to think about, right? Yeah, there's a lot to think about. That's and you made that right. comment looking over leases and all that. Yeah. That's part of what ends up happening when you're. Yeah. I mean, work. you, you end up with needing various skill sets you never imagined you yes. would need in ministry. And that's, yes. that's true of whatever route you go. But I, we also found in our research that, um, you know, it's not as if pastors need to to actually get all the skill sets in order to make something happen. Really, the biggest skill set is collaboration, right? So learning how how to collaborate with people who do have the skills uh, to help you imagine. Now, um, so so renting space is just one piece. Uh, another case study uh, was a church that. Uh, that actually got uh, sold their church building um, because it was in a neighborhood that wasn't especially aligned with their mission. Um, and they uh, bought a much larger space that needed a lot of work, but it was in an area of the city that they felt really called to serve. And so they bought that, they, they refurbished it over lots of time. And like yours, they had a parking lot next to them and they built um, a hostel, a youth hostel. And now they have this incredible program where uh, college students, high school students, college students, seminary students come from all over the country to Memphis, to the Civil Rights Museum. They stay at the hostel. And then the actual, they do have renters inside their, um, inside their church, but those renters are curated carefully to align with the, the whole mission. And there are, um, they, they hire those 
folks to actually work with the youth who are there to experience the Civil Rights Museum and to process that and to learn how to become involved. Um, and, and so this is an example of, uh, of looking at your mission, letting that drive you and then say, you know, is the place we're at even, um, you know, the place that really we, we should be in order to, to align ourselves with, with that mission. So, you know, it can be highly um, creative outside of the box, even looking at selling property and buying other property, that kind of thing. Any other examples that pop in your mind, Mark? Well, so there's an interesting example here in Madison. Um, so I'm working uh, really good. I think we might talk about this a little bit more later, but we, we are working with churches around the country through our Oikos Accelerator, which is an accelerator program that helps congregations think about using their property for social enterprise and revenue generation and, and mission-aligned um, money uh, activities. Anyways, there's two churches here in Madison that are actually different denominations, but they're choosing to um, merge basically. And what they're doing is they're selling one of their properties uh, to a developer to build housing. And then they're taking the proceeds from that sale in order to redevelop the other property into a more community center um, where the church will meet for worship and its, its other activities, as well as then be better designed for the sorts of things like we saw in that video that they want to do, um, intentional partnerships and, and programming. So that's a really interesting example of a whole bunch of things going on. Merger. Right. Um, oh, I love you said they chose sales, to merge. They cho <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, they chose to merge. I mean, you know, usually merger is like, you know, such a downer. People see it as like failure. But no, this is like the, this is the plan to merge and to use the assets yeah. and create something amazing. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, I have a, I have an MBA, which sometimes isn't always, you know, it's, it's, it's maybe not always a good thing. And the church is certainly not a business, but merger is, is extraordinarily common in the business world. And it usually is done in order to do something better, to do something more, to do something, to bring together synergies that might be, you know, exist or to bring together efficiencies in order to do, to carry out the mission of that business better. There's no reason why in some cases that isn't also true for churches that we That's can, true. we can do that and we can actually then um, produce more fruitful ministry and, uh, and, and manage kind of the realities of our environment and the changing dynamics of, of the market, so to speak, that we're dealing with and what people are looking for and what, what's, um, what's connecting. Yeah. yeah. And that's really, I mean, you're, you're speaking of a particular mindset and uh, a shift in mindset around, you know, what, what does a merger mean or any other kinds of things like this, that, that in fact, um, you know, you say uh, in your book that we have to shift our understanding away from, you know, this is failure to, to this is actually quite innovative and this is life giving, this is resurrection. And this is somebody said in the, in the chat I saw over there, it's like composting, right? <laughs> Which creates fertile ground for new things. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that the pastor of the, in that video reflected that the, the part of the reason it may have worked well for them was the church was sort of um, had not, not much to lose at the point uh, in the sense that they, they were kind of a bit desperate, which is on one level um, sad or difficult, right? For those of us leading congregations and, or leading in the church, but on another level, it is an opportunity, right? It's an opportunity when um, when we look around and we say, we really have no choice but to do something about this. And, uh, and I, I would actually argue that's true kind of countrywide and city, you know, community-wide. There is going to be a massive shift in the use of church property over the next five to 10 years um, that's going to change the very social fabric of our cities and our neighborhoods. And there's, whether we like it or not, is somewhat irrelevant in that it's going to happen. Um, it's a little bit like the scene in Lord of the Rings when, when Frodo and talking to Gandalf and kind of complaining about what they're facing. And Gandalf just says, well, that's just, that's the time that's been given to us. This is the time we're in. This is the time that's been given to us. We're in this moment. It's not easy. 
it's very hard to be a pastor in this moment. It's very hard to do this work. Um, but this is what is before us, right? This is the call that is before us is to think about and to deal with these realities and to try to move forward, just step at a time, you know, um, uh, with as much faith, creativity, <laughs> um, hopefulness as we can, uh, recognizing that it is difficult, but it's coming, it's happening to whether sort of whether we want it to or not. And so it's up to us to decide what we want to do with that, with that reality and how to move forward. Talk to me a little bit about what you call in your book, the lie of scarcity. Lie of scarcity. Yeah. I mean, I think (laughs) it's related to this idea that we, we, we have this narrative and, and this, again, it's not everywhere. It's not in every setting. It's certainly more prevalent in the mainline church, although it's pretty much true across Christianity in the United States now that, that we're in decline and that there's less people, <clears throat> there's less money. You know, we can only, we can only sort of hunker down. We can only, we can only shrink. We can only um, do less. And I just don't think that's true. And again, it, it, it's, it's, partly because we're thinking about a model of funding and a model of ministry that we've had for many decades, but that is changing where basically people come to the church for worship and then they give money in the plate, or maybe now they give it online because we figured that out, but it's still the same thing really. (laughs) And, and, uh, and that model to some extent is still happening, but, um, but it's not going to sustain financially uh, in all in all set in all places anymore. It just simply isn't going to. You know, in my campus ministry center, campus ministry for many many decades was funded by denominations. So to sort of extend that story, I just told money would flow from congregations to uh, from members into congregations, then up to denominations, and then denominations would flow that money back out to mission mm-hmm. and to things like campus ministry. Well, at this point, I, our budget is 2.4 million a year. And I think we get a thousand dollars a year from the denomination. I mean, we, nothing basically, right. We're totally on our own. Um, it's a little bit different in different parts of the country where there's still kind of vestiges of, of that, but, but by and large, we're on our own to figure out how we're going to, how we're going to fund, uh, fund our work. And so we got to think about the other assets that we have. Again, property being one of those for sure, that's extremely valuable um, in many places. And then invested assets. There's literally trillions of dollars invested that the church that the church you know um, owns, and that the church broadly speaking owns. Some individual churches have endowments. That was mentioned in that video, actually. Um, others uh, uh, maybe don't, but their denominational structures do. Their pension funds do. Their foundations that are attached to them do. The seminaries do church related colleges do i mean there's 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 billions trillions of dollars of invested money there um and what we do with it basically is we put it in the stock market and we we basically hand it over to mark zuckerberg and to jeff bezos and to apple and to google and uh they use that money every day every second of every day to grow their business and they pay us a small amount of that back in terms of uh, investment returns, which we then use to fund things that we do. But what the question I've been asking a lot lately is why aren't we using that money, the capital directly to, to actually invest in some of these things and to actually grow some of these enterprises, um, not just take 5% uh, uh, annual earnings off of these huge pots of money while most of the time that money is being used to just help somebody grow their business. And instead we could be um, potentially launching and growing um, enterprises within the church. Um, That is partly what we did at Press House. We actually took uh, an investment. Part of our, part of our financing is an investment from the Synod of Lakes and Prairies, a denominational partner. And they took a quarter of their endowment out of the stock market and invested at a Press House which allows us to do our ministry. And then we, we pay them back a return on their investment and they use the money we pay them back to do ministry. So we're doing ministry with their money and then we're giving them money back and they're doing ministry with their money. And it's all staying within uh, the family, so to speak. Right. And it's all doing ministry versus helping 
you know, make Instagram more addictive for teenagers. Right, right. right. So you've created an, an ecosystem of sorts that feeds right. back into the the ways that you want the money to work. Correct. Yeah. Yes. So this yeah. might be a good time for, for us to bring up a couple of terms that people may or may not be familiar with. Uh, that's impact investing and what you call redemptive entrepreneurship. Can you just tell us a little yeah. bit more about that? Yeah. So um, if you're interested in terms, there are there's a whole glossary in the back of my book that I tried to write. Thank you. Or sort of, <laughs> yeah, around business terms, but with with just like a more of a church mindset, like how we would approach these things. Um, but yeah, so impact investing is this idea of what I just described, where essentially we investors, which can be individuals, it can be institutions, take money and not just invest it in the where they're going to get the highest financial return at the lowest risk, but they invest it where they're going to get um, a mission-based return um, as well, or perhaps even primarily that's the reason that they invest it. Um, so traditional investing is really putting your money wherever you can get the most financial return from that money. Uh, and that lately has been like Facebook and Amazon and, you know, Zoom actually would have been a great place to put it. Um, Tesla has been a great place to put it, right, um, recently. Uh, and, you know, that's what we do with our money. We invest it in these companies and then they pay back a return on it. Um, Impact investing is basically saying, not only do I want to get a financial return with my money, but I want to, I want to make an impact with my money in the world mm -hmm. that isn't just growing these businesses, that is something else, that has some, somehow tied to my values, um, in my case, to my theology, tied to what, you know, what I want to see happen in the world. So I'm on the board of WCCN, Working Capital for Community Needs. That's an organization that takes investment from individuals. I personally am invested in it. Um, and institutions, churches actually are as well, denominations. Um, many Catholic sisters organizations have been doing this for decades. They've been leading the way on this for a long, long time, way before anyone even knew about this sort of thing. And they take uh, uh, money and they invest it in WCCN. And then we actually lend it out to the working poor in Latin America for them to grow their, their businesses, which in, is usually like buying an oven so that they can make tortillas yeah. and sell them and provide for their family. Very different purpose, again, than making Facebook more addictive for teenagers and generating revenue from that, right? So yeah. it's the idea of placing money um, intentionally for social impact. And often there are financial returns associated with it as well. They may or may not match kind of the other returns that are out there, but, uh, but it is possible in many cases to, to generate both mission impact and uh, financial impact. Social entrepreneurship is kind of where the money goes, right? So social entrepreneurship is what we did at Press House where we built mission-based housing um, that uh, generates revenue and serves a social good, both. And, uh, and so we've engaged in this idea of, uh, of social entrepreneurship, re redemptive entrepreneurship, social enterprise, they're all kind of related terms that basically mean doing something interesting, using kind of sort of lightly touch, you might say business practices, revenue generation to also impact lives of, of folks and, uh, and doing it in a more financially sustainable way. Um, like one example that I think is really interesting is some churches have been exploring turning food pantries that they might have had run for years and years and years, beloved kind of ministries into uh, grocery co-ops where they basically actually greatly expand the food pantry and then invite the neighborhood to become members, a member owned co-op grocery store. They would still perhaps give food away to those that need it um, to be given to them, but it actually produces a much more sustainable, um, long-term viable, wealth creating of sorts uh, model um, and addresses the food desert that might have produced the need for the food pantry to begin with. Um, and so that's a great idea, a great example of social enterprise redemptive entrepreneurship um, at work and using church space uh, to do that. So um, all these great ideas, you know, people may be saying, gosh, I, how, how, do, how do we even discern 
you know, where, which direction to go, what to do. Um, and that's really, you know, you're, you're part of the co-founders of Rooted Good. Um, and you mentioned the accelerator, uh, the Oikos accelerator. Would you tell us a little bit more about that work? And um, because that seems to be at the heart of helping churches to figure out, to discern how they might uh, go along this path. Yeah, I, I mean, so really good. We're we're really committed to working with and supporting catalytic leaders anywhere in the church sort of world um, that are interested in this stuff. And we're doing it on a bunch of levels, sort of with, with seminaries, with denominations, with judicatories, and then one of our programs is with churches. Um, it's the Ocus Accelerator. It's funded by a grant. Um, and at the moment, we have about forty churches in that program. It's done through an online learning platform, which was COVID required, but has actually turned out to be really useful because we can then distribute it much more widely um, with some in-person uh, uh, things we hope coming soon. Um, but basically it's, it's, it's kind of like a, like a startup business or a social enterprise accelerator, but for churches, mm -hmm. um, which is both, which is kind of interesting and sometimes challenging actually for them to think about it. Um, but it really gets at these questions of um, what is our neighborhood looking for? What is the need in our neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And to some extent, kind of what is their demand for? Um, because if you're going to do social enterprise, there has to be demand for something. Um, and what is, it, what, is, what is it that we as a congregation can uniquely offer and do in that setting, right? And so um, trying to start there, uh, it's got tools in it like a game, Mission Possible game that allows um, folks to think very creatively about um, design thinking and learn that process. There's a skills deck game that helps gather all the different skills of community of members of the congregation to sort of get a profile inventory of the skills that are in the congregation. Um, and it works congregations through these questions in order to um, hopefully arrive at some ideas a bit like an accelerator or incubator would in a, in, a, in a sort of startup setting to come up with ideas of what can we do? What can we do with our building? What can we do as a congregation um, that would serve the needs of, of our community? Um, so that's, that's, what that's, that's really what that's all about. Yeah, that's great. And that's so important that we, we have avenues for folks to learn how to think in these ways, because it's, it is not the way that, that some of us were trained in seminary to think, um, <laughs> you know, speaking of which we had a question here from uh, Francis, curious to know if Mark is involved with seminaries to develop courses on teaching future church leaders about impact investing and how investing in general works to fund mission. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's something that that uh, has sparked at my seminary as well in our conversations and hoping to do more with you all. Um, what else could you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to. I mean, this is the answer that I would love to do that. I think we could totally use that. Yeah. We need that. Um, uh, I don't know that that's happening a whole lot. Um, we are with Rudy Good working with different seminaries around certain things that they're doing. Um, but, you know, seminary curriculum is fairly traditional still. And, uh, and yes, this, I would love to do that. So if, I, yeah. if anyone has a connections, I'm happy to, I'm happy to engage in that. I would have loved to have known a lot of that stuff myself when right. I did my MDiv. I did my MDiv and then I did an MBA about 12, 14 years later. And um, uh, I don't think every pastor needs an MBA, but I do think there's some things that to learn from uh, that are useful. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that came out of our research that was connected to the seminary where I teach, San Francisco Theological Seminary, is that it's not necessarily just about adding business courses, but it's about, say, in your theology course, talking about how do you talk to churches about shifting ecclesiologies in a 21st century world, you know, so it's, it's almost to embed this in the core uh, curriculum is also an important thing, not just to tack on maybe a, a business course, but uh, both and perhaps. Yeah. Um, so we, with the, the time we have left, I think that's the only question that I saw coming up in the Q and A. Um, but I, I'd love to hear more about what you believe are the wicked problems of the day that 
I mean, we're talking about the process of figuring out what to do in our neighborhoods, but there, there are some wicked problems that you've, you've mentioned, and that's important to you. I know that redemptive entrepreneurship looks at the, the reality of the problems that we face as a society. So would you, uh, would you talk a little bit about the things that you see that we need to, as church, be passionate about? Yeah, I mean, I imagine that most people here have things that they are passionate, you know, that they that they that they're um, passionate about. I mean, I think certainly um, racial equity is a big is a big issue uh, in many. So really, I mean, it certainly is across the country. I think we we I should say in relation to some of these issues, even around property and investment assets, one of the challenges we face in predominantly white-led institutions, which I'm a part of, the PCUSA or historically white-led institutions, I should say, is that the property that we have was most cases uh, uh, stolen. The land was taken from indigenous people that, that our churches sit on. And in many cases, um, invested assets uh, were started out, at least, by, uh, with connections to slavery. So Princeton Seminary, which has been mentioned in the chat here with their farm and area is a great example. That's where I went to seminary. But a lot of the endowment money that they have has ties to slavery. Um, and that's something we got to reckon with, I think. You know, what does that mean? I mean, what does it mean with regard to considering reparations? With cons what does it mean to use our buildings, to use our assets when they have that legacy? Um, and particularly when that is an issue that's very relevant in today. But there's lots of other issues around, you know, um, income inequality, um, health care, education, um, climate change is a big one. I mean, a huge one, obviously, that, that we are sort of head in the sand on, I think, still in many cases, at least as far as actually making change. Um, one example of, of, of what churches are doing that's really interesting is affordable housing. So you might see stories about that. There's quite, um, quite a movement about building affordable housing on church property. Um, and I think when it's truly affordable, um, it's, it's a really interesting model because what you're, what's happening there is there are a lot of sort of community-wide issues that stem from a lack of affordable housing. Yeah. If you can imagine a child that doesn't have a good place to live uh, is living in a car, we have this here in Madison, you know, or, or is sort of transitionally homeless between different families or whatnot, it's very difficult to do well in school. Their other health outcomes are gonna be, you know, difficult. There's so many other related issues, wicked problems that come with a lack of affordable housing in a community. If churches have property in central spots in cities or anywhere really where affordable housing can be built, that's something to consider because that doesn't just then kind of um, address the symptoms of issues where the sorts of things that churches often get involved with, um, food insecurity and so on and so forth. But building affordable housing or providing affordable housing, expanding that can actually get to the root cause of some of these issues. So it really moves the needle, so to speak, in a community in a way that we often are trying to do anyways, but we're doing it through, you know, small mission giving here and volunteerism here and so on and so forth. There's nothing wrong with those things. We need to be doing those right, things as right. well. But we can sometimes actually take much greater steps forward um, with the issues that we're trying to address uh, by tackling yeah. root problems like, for, like that. Yeah. yeah, and after we say goodbye, I will play a, uh, a short video about a church who did just that. They discerned that affordable housing on their property was the way to go, was the way to follow their, their call and their passion um, and their ministry um, values. So I'll do that after we sign off, if those of you who want to stick around to watch it. Um, Mark, I, let's see. I just saw another question pop up. Let's see. Um, Bob says, it seems that the arts are making a, a comeback, especially music and drama. I've suggested my church consider converting some of our classrooms into music studios for private lessons, basically suggesting the church offer an academy for the arts and exploring ways to integrate that into our ongoing ministry. Thoughts? Yeah, that's a really interesting example. I've seen a few churches looking at um, at that sort of a thing. That is one of the things that church buildings are closer to being set up for already. Right. Um, 
recital space, you know, organs, music uh, is something that we kind of know how to do or have done yeah. often. Classrooms, very useful. Um, and so there is a way in which, uh, which that can be a really powerful um, ministry connection to the neighborhood, to the community. I think for me, the core questions with that would be, it's sort of the same with, with, with any enterprise really, but would be A, how does it really connect to the mission of the church? And in what way, and, I, and besides the idea that if they come into the building for music, they'll come on Sunday morning. Right. That is not a connection in my mind. So it, A, it won't happen. <laughs> Right. I, I just don't think it will. And, yeah. and B, that's yeah. not what I mean. Like that's right. Uh, if we build it, they will come is not the model that I'm that I'm talking about here. So in what way does it really connect yeah. with the mission of the church? That's probably the most important. Not just if they're in the building, they might show up on Sunday. That's not what that's. Well, that's, and I that's the th- that's really one of those mindset shifts that we're talking about, too. And unfortunately, denominations still m- many still measure success or mission by butts in the seats. And actually, so that's a mind shift that's going to have to happen denominationally in order for churches to really let go of that, you know, if we build it, they will come kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think the second consideration is what I sort of mentioned earlier, which is, does it work financially? You know, really, does it really work financially? But um, not just sort of the simple rent payment you might receive, but like kind of the whole costs associated with it. Does it make sense? Is it um, is it viable? Because you can put an awful lot of effort into things that a don't really help your mission and b don't really generate revenue. And if <laughs> then it's why are we doing that? So let's do things that are gonna right. that are gonna help um, uh, address both of those problems. Um, uh, but yes, I think figuring out different ways to measure success is important and to describe what success looks like because it. Um, it, it can't just be how many people are in the seats on a Sunday morning. Um, right, right. What, what does it look like? Again, that's back to the very original question we started with. What does it mean to be the church? And how do we describe that, articulate that, mm-hmm. um, and paint that picture? And then, and to some extent, perhaps even measure that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we're coming to the end of our time. So I want to I want to finish with a quote from your book that really goes, I mean, this is a perfect segue into it. And then um, I will we'll say goodbye. I'll play this uh, short clip of another church and what they did with the affordable housing. And then I have a slide that has like three things that you put in your book that churches could do uh, as they begin to step forward. So um, this quote that I want to read from your book uh, says, shifting the primary use of a church property from Sunday services to co-working space that creates community is not failure. It is transformation. Supplementing income and mission activity by turning an unused education wing of a church into a grocery co-op that addresses a neighborhood food desert is not failure, it is innovation. Closing a congregation after many years of fruitful ministry, tearing down the church building and repurposing the property for affordable housing is not failure, it is rebirth. May We may grieve the changes, we should celebrate the past, but let us also look forward to new life and what God will do through us next. Uh, Amen. Amen to that, Mark. And I just want to thank you for uh, spending time with us today, but also for the book, for your work, um, and for the ongoing conversation that uh, I'm hoping to have so that our seminaries can also begin to help prepare pastors um, for for ministry in in this age, where these are some of the seminal questions in the um, so any closing words for us, Mark? I, I mean, I, that's great. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be with you. I just want to offer blessings to everyone who's, who's here and uh, who's listening, watching later um, on your ministry. It's, it's a tough time. And uh, I just want to offer my, my blessings to you and press on and let's do this. Let's do this work together. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, friends, uh, I will, some some people asked about links to the videos. I'll put those in the notes uh, of this webinar, uh, the chat in the notes, because some good ideas were coming through in the in the chat as well. So um, let's, let's end with uh, another little story and then uh, have a blessed day, friends.
On the night before Jesus died, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. When you eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. So what Arlington Presbyterian did with their building was that they blessed it and then they broke it. And then they said, this is the body of Christ and we're gonna share it with the neighborhood in South Arlington. The vision was to meet the neighbors where the neighbors were at, and that was that people cannot afford to live in Arlington County. So if you are a daycare worker, if you are a construction worker, if you are working in the schools, you, you, you wanna be able to work and live in your community. One of the things that Spirit was, was helping us see was that we did not need to be attached to the money or the land. We are not looking to that to ensure our survival. The entrepreneurship spirit of these individuals um, bring them this uh, excitement and, and ideas to open businesses. So it's a, it's a way to use food as this center, as this catalyst for change that involves the community at large. And, uh, and we want to expand that to more individuals, to other populations. So I have this image of uh, like this building that's just full of power, that, that we're in this place where we all are learning how to be responsible citizens to create a South Arlington that you know, has even more affordable housing, that has even more jobs that have a living wage, where, where we can all live you know, as fully beloved and with our belovedness as an essential part of who we are. Thanks, Mark, so much. Um, I love that you said that uh, we can learn about it. It's it's okay if it's all Greek. All of this in investment kind of thing is all Greek to us. Uh, many of us went to seminary and learned Greek. It can be done. Um, <laughs> it can, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Participate in an accelerator project uh, pr process. Um, you list several in your book um, and uh, certainly rooted good is a wonderful place to, to learn more about that. And then there are conferences and, and entities like SOCAP and Faith and Finance that are um, helping us to do better impact investing uh, and that kind of thing. So these are some really great um, things to follow up with. All right, friends, many blessings. May you make more room in the end than you ever imagined. Uh, and be inspired in this Advent Christmas season uh, to incarnate that hospitality and possibility uh, beyond your wildest imagination. Many blessings. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>